Hi everyone, my name's Adoris Vitok. You might be wondering why an 11 year old is speaking to you today. Well, at the age of 7, I published my first book, Flying Fingers Master the Tools of Learning Through the Joy of Writing. More recently, I published this book, Dancing Fingers. It's a collection of poetry that I published with my older sister, Adriana. So today, I'm here to talk a little bit about descriptive writing. More specifically, the title of this series is It's Your World, Descriptive Writing. And today, Camtasia Studio is helping me make this video and share it with you today. You may be wondering, what do we use descriptive writing for exactly? Well, we all use descriptive writing, though we may not even know it. A radio host uses description when he or she creates a report on a new gardening program in schools. You use description when you talk about your sister's horrible haircut. Your parents use description when they describe the horrible punishments they'll inflict on you if you don't take the garbage out. What are some of our basic goals in descriptive writing? In descriptive writing, we should describe the senses, give impressions, use literary devices like figurative language and show-not-tell to enhance our writing. Those are a few of the things we want to do. The senses. When you look around a crowded room, feel the soft wool in a winter hat, smell the scent of roses on a warm spring day, or taste dumplings in a Chinese restaurant, you are using your senses. In descriptive writing, it is essential to describe the senses. So, you want to describe the object of your descriptive writing so that the reader can touch it, taste it, hear it, see it, and smell it. When we write descriptively, we want to give our reader an impression of the subject. For instance, if we're writing about a spooky castle, we want to give the reader the impression that it is spooky. Detail is great, but sometimes there can be too much of it. For instance, somebody just looking at a castle isn't going to know exactly how many rooms it has or how far away a stable is. So here's an overly detailed example. The castle had 322 rooms of black tables. In one of the rooms, there was a closet, also black, that was 2 feet and 3 inches tall. A sharp scream came from one of the stables, the wooden stables, excuse me, two and a half miles away. A lady with hair breadths jumped out of bed, folded her coverlet to the side in the new style, took off her covers, and looked out a stained glass window. And here's an example, too, of giving an impression. The colossal castle had many rooms and mysterious black furniture. Suddenly, a shrill and piercing scream rose from the stables. The lady jumped from her bed and immediately looked out her window. Now, let's go over a few techniques we can use in descriptive writing, such as show-not-tell, similes and metaphors, word choice, and onomatopoeia. Show-not-tell. In movies, narrators don't tell you George is sad. They show you a scene of George crying. The same principle, show not tell, applies to writing. So how could we show not tell that these people are happy? You can pause for some time to think about it. Glad to see that you're back. Well, let's have a look at some body language. Well, they're standing up on their tippy toes, holding their arms up. See big smiles splash on their faces, their eyes are wide. They're, what are they holding? Bouquets of flowers, a big dollar sign. So this is possibly a corporate event. Maybe they've raked in some big profits. And they're, um, they look maybe like they're shouting in glee, jumping up and down. Include all these things when you are trying to show that the people are happy. So instead of saying the people are happy, you say they're jumping up in the air, they're holding bouquets, they're smiling widely, congratulating each other, etc. Words should paint pictures. You can use figurative language or similes and metaphors in your writing to help readers get distinct mental images. Figurative language, by the way, compares the thing you are describing to some, to some apparently unrelated animal, object, force of nature, or person. Here's the definition of simile. Simile is a figure of speech in which two things are compared, often in a phrase introduced by like or as. For example, the baby's teeth were white as pearls. Or, the dog's tongue was red as a ruby. Now, the, the red as ruby might be a little cliche, but I think the dog's tongue is new. Or you could say, the ruby was red as a dog's tongue. So these are a few examples of similes. Now, pause the screen to come up with one simile of your own. Great to see that you're back. 
sure you wrote a great simile. Let's move on to metaphors. A metaphor is a figure of speech in which a term or phrase is applied to something to which it is not literally applicable in order to suggest a resemblance. Example, the king was a lion. Obviously, the king isn't really a lion, but he might be like courageous or powerful, for instance. Let's have a look at a few example similes and metaphors. Her skin was white as snow, her lips were red as roses, he was as big as an ox, she was as delicate as a flower. Wait a second, haven't we heard these before? People often rely on the same similes and metaphors to describe things. An overused expression is called a cliché. If you have heard or seen an expression before, it may be a cliché. Try to avoid overusing these in your writing. So here's an activity for you. Spot the figure of language clichés in the passage on the next slide. And in your writing notebook or on a piece of paper or on a word processor, come up with two alternative expressions for each cliché. Spot the clichés. My sister is really annoying. She's a health junkie, and she always gives me a hard time about eating my favorite dish of deep-fried halibut. She barely eats anything except for organic yogurt with flax and wheat germ. As a result, she's as skinny as a beanpole, while I'm as fat as a pig. My sister rubs it in, too. Not to mention, she's a tattletale. Once she caught me eating ice cream before dinner. I paid her ten dollars not to tell her parents. Guess what she did? She gave the $10 to our parents as a gift, which they couldn't very well take back, and then told them what I'd done. That girl is as crafty as a fox. Pause the screen to find them all. Once you return, we'll go over them. Glad to see that you're back. Let's have a look at some of the cliches here. Okay, uh, firstly, skinny as a beanpole. Haven't we heard that one before? fat as a pig and no I'm not being self-deprecating on purpose let's see that girl is as crafty as a fox okay now let's sing some replacements and these ones I'm not going to check because really anything you come up with as long as it's not a cliche is going to be correct have a great time coming up with new alternative examples hello again now we can continue Word choice. In life, we consider our choices to try to make the best decision, or at least I hope you do. We should try to do the same with words. We use some words pretty commonly, like look, big, and move. But we can be a lot more precise when we use words like scrutinize, colossal, and trudge. These words really give an impression. Scrutinize means to inspect carefully. Colossal means not just big, but also sometimes impressive, and trudging is slow, weary walking. When you use the same words over and over in your writing, you create a world that doesn't have much variety. So let's have a look at a, a somewhat um, exaggerated example of bad word choice. All the houses on our street are very ugly. Let's circle that. Mrs. Gibbons lives in a big ugly house. And let's circle big too because that's not very precise. Just like down the street. If it's Gerald's live in an ugly house too we live in a oh guess what big ugly house okay so those are a few examples but another one that we might not have caught house we can be a lot more precise house houses house okay so it's reused again and again let's see how many times it's used four times then ugly uh four times big two times so houses well, you might think, well, how else can we replace houses? But there are tons of things you can do. Mansions. So let me write that out. Uh, so I could say all the mansions on our house are very ugly. We could say uh, all the chalets, all the chateaus, all the castles, all the villas, all the hovels. Uh, since they're big, I think it might be more mansion, chateau, villa manner kind of thing. So you can really easily replace these. Ugly, what's the synonym for ugly? Any ideas? Okay, hideous is a great one. Big, what's another word for big? Ginormous, maybe. That's one that I get a lot from students suggesting that. So you can really change up a lot of things here. Here's a tip. Using a variety of words creates a more interesting, vivid picture. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I hope that you've enjoyed learning about descriptive writing, and I hope that you will use some of these techniques in your own writing. Looking forward to seeing you next time.
Thanks.